Greetings, folks. I'm Matt Galt, the Director of Education at the Braddock's Battlefield History Center. And today I am joined by Josh Freeman of Fort Necessity National Battlefield and Bob Nipar, Braddock's Road Preservation Association. And as we're talking to you on the anniversary of the Battle of Monongahela, we are going to be talking a little bit today, of course, about that battle, but the aftermath. Because we all are familiar with what happens during Braddock's defeat of the Battle of Monongahela, where we have this terrible devastation of Braddock's army, and about two-thirds of his army are killed or wounded. Now, in our textbooks, we usually focus on that and General Braddock himself being buried, which we are at the original site where he was buried in the road that would bear his name. So, Josh, would you want to uh, talk a little bit about what happens directly after the battle? Sure, yeah. So obviously the Battle of the Monongahela, Braddock's defeat on July 9th, 1755, uh, that sort of cataclysmic, you know, decisive battle that happens that day. On the afternoon of July 9th, uh, the Army, obviously, we think, you know, right around 4 p.m. begins this sort of mass exodus from the battlefield. It begins this very disordered sort of retreat all the way back uh, along the road uh, towards uh, the detachment 2nd Division or rear column under Colonel Dunbar. Uh, Washington, of course, makes that famous ride overnight to get back to Dunbar's camp and you know, deliver word of the de defeat of the orders from Braddock to push supplies forward to the army uh, wagons to try to you know, move the wounded uh, back off the battlefield and off the retreat. And so uh, the army, you know, throughout uh, the, the evening of July 9th into the morning of the 10th and all the way throughout the 10th that will begin to sort of straggle in and initially in ones and twos, I think, you know, the wagons and the wagon masters from the army who had sort of fled the battlefield early, get back first and with word uh, of this cataclysmic defeat. Uh, the Army's second division, the rear column, is then encamped at what is now known as Dunbar's camp, but uh, very close to the Jamonville Glen unit of Fort Necessity National Battlefield, really on the site today of uh, the Jamonville camp and retreat center. And uh, the, the Army there will begin to you know get word of, of the defeat of, of the advance column, the flying column, of the general's wounding and of many of the men being killed and wounded. And so uh, panic will start to set in a little bit for those men in, in Dunbar's division. Uh, and again, the, the remnants of the army will begin to filter back uh, throughout the, you know, the night of July 9th and into the, the, the morning and throughout the day of July 10th. Uh, sometime in the, in the late afternoon, evening of July 10th, Braddock himself will arrive at, at Dunbar's camp uh, with sort of the main body that had been able to be organized to sort of conduct an organized retreat back to, to Dunbar's camp. And then preparations will almost immediately begin to be made for the army to retreat. Uh, Braddock gives orders for, for the destruction of, of much of the army's supplies. Uh, wagons are in short supply at this point, and those wagons that are available and the horses, even more specifically, that are available to haul those wagons are required to move the wounded back from uh, Dunbar's camp for the retreat uh, all the way back to Virginia. And so um, because wagons are, are scarce, they need to basically destroy all the supplies that they can to, to make sure that they don't fall into the enemy's hands. And, you know, that's a fairly controversial decision, uh, you know, amongst the British Army at that time and the officers that are still there. Uh, it's a controversial decision amongst historians today. But nonetheless, Braddock, whether he was, you know, in good mind and, and conscious enough to make that sort of order and determination, uh, he does give those orders and, and the Army just starts to destroy much of the ordnance, the ammunition, uh, what artillery is left. Um, and even many of the provisions and, and foodstuffs that the Army still had to load the wounded on the wagons and, and begin the retreat. Uh, the Army would begin retreating uh, really on the 11th, and it would sort of limp its way down Chestnut Ridge, uh, heading again back west along the road that they had built. The Army would arrive here on July 13th, uh, just to the west of us, where we are right now at the Braddock Grave Unit of Fort Necessity National Battlefield at a camp that's known as the Steep Bank Camp just behind this creek that you see uh, running behind us. And uh, on the evening of July 13th, uh, Braddock would actually would die, it would pass away. Uh, he would be buried right here where we're standing on the morning of July 14th in a service officiated by Washington, uh, buried here in the middle of the Braddock Road uh, to disguise the grave so that uh, the, the, the grave could not be found um, you know, by either the French American Indian allies uh, or anyone else that was really looking for it. Buried here in the middle of the road, the army would march over it, and they would continue their retreat, uh, trying to you know, back down Braddock's Road towards Fort Cumberland. Yeah, so I can imagine that during this time, if you're just a regular soldier that has just come back from this this terrible battle, 
that if you get word that now the general has passed, that this is just a whole nother wave of anxiety, fear, you know, so I'm sure the, the these soldiers are really, yeah. what they're feeling is, is something completely very difficult to understand. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously the survivors of the battle themselves, those participants who had been with the advanced column and had participated in, mm-hmm. in the battle are, you know, broken in, right. in, in more ways than one, you know, physically and psychologically, the, the effects of that defeat and of this, you know, many of the accounts you read are this sort of unseen ghostly enemy that is pouring fire into them, you know, throughout the battle. And so those men themselves, the, the survivors, uh, you know, not just the wounded, but those who are, are un, you know, unwounded have these scars of the battle that most certainly are affecting, you know, their ability to really do anything, to, you know, to fall in under arms, to conduct any type of security or really act as a soldier in any way, I think probably would have been very difficult for these men. For the men that were in Dunbar's column, the vast majority of them, um, somewhat raw recruits, were the recruits of the 44th and 48th regiments that had been raised here in the American colonies when those regiments arrived. That's really the, the majority of Dunbar's men. Um, yeah, so they, you know, untrained in many ways, sort of, you know, they were left behind for many reasons. And so, you know, the the, the, the advent of this news that, you know, mm-hmm. these trained, you know, that the, there was I mean, so many hopes in the British Army and really sort of a, a foregone assumption of victory that once Again, those initial reports come back to Dunbar's camp that this defeat has occurred. I think immediately, uh, and you read accounts of officers who were there that, you know, the men, there were men that immediately, as soon as word got back, started to try to desert. That Dunbar had to take what experienced soldiers he had and basically place them all the way around the camp as sort of sentinels to guard from the, and so, yeah, throughout that process, as these guys are straggling back into the camp, and then Washington arrives with sort of an official word account of what had happened. Uh, yeah, that, that, the army is, is very, very shaky. And these men are, you know, affected in many, many ways. And then, yeah, the, the general arrives every, and as the rest of the army straggles in and this sort of, I think it, the, you know, the magnitude of what has happened starts to set in amongst the whole army. It, it, you know, it is, it's a, it's this dejected sense of defeat. It's this unbelievable kind of psychological breakdown of the army of, of not being able to comprehend what had happened and the effects of, you know, that defeat itself. And then, you know, the, the, that it may happen again, that the French Indian force may be chasing them or coming here to attack them. Yeah, I think unbelie- for these for these men, um, it, it would have been an unbelievably difficult time for them. It's hard to imagine exactly what they're thinking. And, and yeah, as the general dies, you know, it's um, I think Braddock, although he's you know kind of you know lampooned and, and criticized much later, it's, it does seem from the accounts of the time that, that many in the army you know loved them or at least respected him immensely and, and his death I think is a severe blow to, to the army. Any sort of hopes of perhaps, you know, rallying and, and, and maybe thinking about a another stand, I think, probably die with Braddock when he does. And I think the army at that point is very much broken. So since you brought up Dunbar, uh, Bob, I did want to mention thinking about now that Braddock has has passed away, that means the next person who's going to take over, that's a difficult role to fill, right? So would you like to talk a little bit about Dunbar and what, what he's going to do now? This is where he's going to go next. Well, as Josh was pointing out, the, the army's pretty much demoralized. Half of it was killed at uh, Braddock's defeat. So you've only got half the army and the men are in bad shape. Um, Dun, uh, Dunbar probably makes the decision around the 16th of July to go to Philadelphia, go into winter quarters, um, you know, wait for a decision from higher ups that either they want to take them in and split them up and send them to build up other units or rebuild those units. A uh, decision is made to rebuild those units. They, they do get rebuilt and they wind up in um, the northern campaigns and actually do very well at Montreal and Louisbourg in those battles up there. But also with the retreating army, those who were able to get away quickly um, started spreading the word. Um, of course, the three most effective colonies, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia, um, were pretty much taken to their knees. And, um, you know, what are they going to do now? Because the superhighway's been built mm-hmm. for the enemy to attack, and they did. Um, natives were, were raiding and um, down as far as outskirts of Williamsburg. Pennsylvania, they pretty much pushed the settlers back across 
the Susquehanna and then the Philadelphia. So that was a big problem on Pennsylvania's hands. Um, at a Quaker um, assembly, Quakers didn't want to fight. What do you do with that? How do you get around that? So there, there were a multitude of other problems that were created with Braddock's campaign and laws. Um, you know, it was protocol then to really, yes, to uh, take the army, um, to destroy the equipment and get them back because you can come back and fight another day, which they did. Um, on the other side, the French, um, one, the natives went back with all their plunder or items that they got off the battlefield, showed it to their families and their friends who were left there. Well, now the friends say, well, why didn't I go? Plus, they don't fear the English anymore based on, you know, them losing in, in such great numbers. So, um, you know, they want to go out and, and attack the settlements. Um, the, um, the French get Bouquet or Braddock's papers. Um, with a, within the papers, it lists other campaigns that uh, Braddock was supposed to take. You're supposed to go up and get the three forts, um, Schalt, uh, LaBeouf, and Prescott. He was to go up and meet Shirley and go after uh, Fort Niagara, which didn't occur. Uh, you know, they now have propaganda the French can use politically against the English, proving that they wanted this war, that they were going to start this war, and trying to blame the French, but the French were in the clear. So, um, multiple problems grew out of that from, from both sides to the people back home as well as um, um, to the settlements uh, on the uh, frontier. So essentially you're saying, you know, this battle has a huge domino effect. Absolutely. That you're going to see ripples that spread all throughout the colonies and of course. Um, there's also a, glo a global picture to look at. You know, the fact that even though uh, this battle happens, uh, here in Western PA that we're all so familiar with, uh, the fact that it has global repercussions as well. Um, and I think that's always something very interesting to talk about. Do you want to mention a little bit about that, Josh, or just how the, those dominoes to fall? Sure, yeah. So I think, uh, and, and Bob highlighted it very well, there's definitely a ripple effect, an immediate effect of, of Braddock's defeat. As, as word trickles back to the colonies, first to Fort Cumberland and Colonel James Innes, who's there, and he, he you know, very hurriedly, very quickly spreads the word to you know, as Bob mentioned, the governors of those colonies sort of directly involved from Pennsylvania and Maryland and, and Virginia. You know, Governor Dinwiddie, when he gets the very first report of Braddock, you know, he can't, he really cannot even bring himself to believe it. I mean, there's no possible way that this occur has occurred. And, um, you know, yeah, very quickly, the alarm goes up uh, all throughout the, those colonies, not just on the frontiers, which obviously those people living on the frontier are at the, at the tip of the spear and the direct impact of, of what's going to be unleashed and what's going to occur. But, you know, throughout the, the colonial assemblies, throughout, you know, the cities on the East Coast, absolutely, there's now, you know, Washington even writes, uh, just really right about the time that Dunbar has made this decision to retreat all the way to Philadelphia, you know, th there's many officers, including Washington at, at Fort Cumberland, who say, you know, without these, this, this force, without establishing and, you know, uh, you know helping to you know, reinforce, like, Fort Cumberland and various other fortifications on the frontier, they, they'll be able to raid right down into Alexandria if they want to. And so, yeah, obviously here in the colonies, there's this immediate impact in, in, of, of the defeat and what's going on. But, yeah, it does spread all over the world. So, you know, it, it, this this massive trove of documentation and evidence that the French have after the battle, uh, you know, in Braddock's papers of the various other campaigns that, that Bob had mentioned. And, you know, one thing I don't think, you know, with 1755 and we look at, at the British military effort in North America, we very often focus in on, on the Bra Battle of the Hill on Braddock's defeat because it is so you know, cataclysmic, and it is this, you know, unbelievable uh, event that occurs that how could this British army, especially from the British point of view, been been destroyed uh, by this French Indian force. But, yeah, we sometimes neglect it. Yeah, Bob mentioned there is a, a four-pronged military offensive against Canada in, in, in 1755. It, it's hard to kind of wrap your head around that when Britain and France are not at war right. in 1755 <laughs> officially. But, yeah, so there's, an, there's a, a, a campaign that's very successful launched in Acadia by the British. Um, there's a, obviously Braddock's campaign that is not very successful at all. And then there's two campaigns that are supposed to be launched in New York, uh, both from around Albany. Uh, one uh, basically due west down the Mohawk Valley, uh, its objective to capture Fort Niagara. As, as Bob mentioned, Braddock was supposed to 
uh, participate in that by the end of the summer. And then you have another campaign that was under Sir William Johnson that was to be launched north to up straight up uh, the, the Lake George, Lake Champlain corridor towards uh, Fort St. Frederick. And so uh, and in that one, it, it, there's you know a, a battle of Lake George where, in which you know is sort of a, a draw. The British it's kind of a victory for them. So you have these four military campaigns. That I think often the other three are overshadowed by by Braddock's defeat. But yeah, very quickly, and I think. The, the cumulative effect, obviously, Braddock's defeat, and that, that is the sort of you know, nexus of understanding British failure in 1795. But really, the inability of any of these major campaigns, except for Acadia, to be successful, uh, sends, you know, kind of shocks the British government and the British imperial system uh, to its core. They, you know, how they're not successful, um, you know, the Duke of Cumberland probably can't understand how his well laid plans have been so, you know, kind of disastrously implemented and how they haven't succeeded. And so, yeah, that, that reverberates around the British world. Um, you know, how could they be defeated? And then the, uh, the French are very quick to capitalize on this massive sort of PR victory with this all this evidence of, yeah, we are not officially at war, yet the British are levying war against yeah. us. And that's going to really push Britain and France, you know, as we as you progress through 1755 and in the spring of 1756, you know, to where we get to the point in May of 1756, where yeah, this massive global war erupts. Uh, but I think you know Braddock's defeat is really at, at the center of that. This ma- major military event, um, which yeah, is a French victory, but it goes full circle into those other military campaigns the British have launched, and and then bringing about this this huge, you know, the largest war of the 18th century that will come to, to the light with the Seven Years' War. And then of course later on, utilizing British force to then eventually in 58 and into 59 take those French strongholds moving in and attacking Fort Duquesne and being able to take that where Braddock failed. So again, yeah, Braddock's defeat starts this whole kind of the snowball down the mountain, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and it's a slow process for the British. Mm-hmm. That process is going to take some time. It's right. going to be a lot of trial and error. Um, again, you know, hard for us to think about today, but but really before this time in history, the, the British government has not paid too much attention to the American colonies. Um, you know, they've sort of allowed the colonies to develop along their own lines. And it's really going to be the advent, you know, of, of, of Braddock coming here, of this imperial official as, you know, Generalissimo and commander in chief of the right. Majesty's Force in North America. Uh, the, the British Empire is going to start to reach out to North America and have try to have a direct effect on how things start to go. And it's going to that's there's some learning curve with that because it's not happened before. And, yeah, it's going to take the British war effort a, a long time to figure it out. Some disastrous defeats that many of these men, as Bob mentioned, uh, who, who are here in this battle, the enlisted soldiers, uh, the 48th and 44th foot, the, the independent companies, uh, many of those men will participate in some of these campaigns. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, as we go in 56, and as Bob mentioned, throughout the campaigns in the north. But yeah, by 1758, the British war machine, I think, has gotten on track. Um, they have solid leadership in, in William Pitt, um, you know, Secretary of State for the Colonies, and, and some decent leaders in place you know, from a military standpoint. The Royal Navy is really going to start to, to dominate the, the seas and and keep the French from reinforcing Canada. So it is a slow sort of learning process, but yeah, Braddock's defeat is, is the, is the beginning of all that. Yeah. Not just at, at all, at all levels of war, uh, from the tactical and sort of reevaluating how they organize the regiments and light infantry, the advent of light infantry in the British army. Um, so from the tactical standpoint on the battlefield, really to, to the operation and the strategic, uh, this is the point the British will really start to reflect on how they can do things better. And that will eventually bear out victory, uh, not just here in North America, mm-hmm. but really, around the globe uh, by the end of this war. So it's really, you know, even though we focus on that battle so much, it's such a crucial point in our history because of what comes from it and gets us, you know, moving along, um, especially when it comes to the fact that we're able to uh, talk to each other today, right? Absolutely. Uh, gets us to this point. Um, so first off, we want to thank you for all watching this. I want to thank you, Bob, uh, for coming and talking with us. Josh, I want to thank you as well. Um, Folks, if you're interested uh, in hearing more about this, learning more about this, the battle itself, the aftermath, what leads up to it, um, please come and visit our historic sites, uh, you know, Fort Necessity National Battlefield, uh, Braddock's Battlefield History Center, and also the Braddock Road Preservation Association has a great conference that's happening in November. Uh, so just check out their website. Uh, Bob will be there and he'd love to talk to you. So. Uh, thank you, folks, and thank you for you know listening to us about this history, and we look forward to seeing you soon.